Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Today we're looking at a late 80s Proton Model 320 AM FM clock radio. And uh, let me see if I can eliminate some wind noise here. And this was a pickup. Uh, it's pretty much suffering the same thing that they all suffer from, which is bad capacitors. These are littered with the purple Matsushita death caps, which pee everywhere and destroy things. And once we get inside, you'll see for certain that that's really the cause. So the symptom is, is it's very low volume and very limited operation. And if I just plug it in, you can give a listen to it. Just a moment here while I do that. So we have a display, and if I turn it on, very slow to respond, if at all. The last time I powered it up, it was responsive, but now it's really not. And that has to do with caps in the logic circuit, which P and cause disruption of this. But you can pretty much do anything you want and it won't respond. Uh, this one's been sitting for a time. As you can see, it has an analog radio. When I adjust the volume, we hear a little bit of noise in the speaker, but not much. And eventually, if I leave it on long enough, it might actually behave itself, but... Yeah, let's get inside and I'll show you the mayhem that you have to do to fix these. Okay, so once you take the screws out the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, stand comes off, take the two screws out the top back, and it comes apart like this. So you have two choices. You can either remove the speaker too, or desolder the wires. And I think uh, we're going to desolder the wires but not before being a smarter person and realizing that this simply unplugs. So this is more or less the radio as you first take it apart. And you can see there's corrosive glue, there's the evil capacitors everywhere, and if we shine a light down inside of here, there's more back in there that you can't really see. But there's your audio output I see there, some discoloration, uh, but yeah, uh, these are kind of a nightmare because they're small, complex, and they're a pain because you have to really recap them if you want to use them. But they are great sounding clock radios. They have a nice radio on them. Uh, not the best sensitivity, but certainly not bad either. And they have a nice full tone control bass and treble on the side here. Uh, so we're going to see if we can resurrect this one because I kind of like it. You're never going to make any money fixing one of these, so it's just really, in this case, for entertainment purposes. So what we have to do is just start taking the screws out, pull the clock board up, and then once you get the clock board up, we have access to the rest of the screws that hold the chassis in. So I'm going to start taking this apart, and then we'll address the various systems and the board work that needs to be done. Okay, so basically once you do undo all your screws, you have access to the top side of the board, undo all the screws down here, and you'll have access to the bottom side of the board. If you want more access, you can take up the transformer as well, uh, and you can loosen that panel there for a little more slack, and then you're pretty much only constrained by the transformer leads. And we can take a peer down in here and see all these lovely capacitors, which just need to get changed. And this is just a big recap fest. But we can pull out the ESR meter for grins and giggles. And there's, it's probably true that a good majority of these are going to be bad. Uh, the main electrolytic. See how it's got that kind of white haze over it? Uh, that usually indicates that it's outcast and it's begun to pee everywhere. Uh, that definitely got hot there. We'll have to check those resistors up top, which are these guys here down on the board. That senior and that resistor there probably established something. 
and that one there that's getting eaten alive by the brown glue we have to see if that one's still alive clean all these function switches I'm not going to try to reproduce the dried up polyurethane foam that goes uh, that keeps the dust out of the machine that's just so much of a hassle but there's probably a good 20 caps in here that have to get changed out now um, I've done a lot of these and that's pretty much the cure for most of the issues but uh, we could take an approach at troubleshooting it but the last time I had it on it was very weak or no sound so I'm pretty much betting that's gonna be a waste of time we'll figure that out anyways but let's get a the ESR meter the capacitor wizard and see what a lot of these check out as so we're gonna come over here to the power supply and check a lot of these power supply ones that one doesn't even register but this one over here that one doesn't register let's just come a couple over here that still does something that one's dead that one's dead let's check this big fat one here that one's still doing something this one back here that one's still doing something and then we'll come over here to the audio section that's supposed to be a 220 microfarad and that registers at about a, a 4 microfarad so that one's about dead but you get the idea uh, pretty much all of these are just trash and they all need to be replaced um, when it did still kind of sort of work the audio was just even all the way with the volume up it was just so quiet and it was kind of unresponsive like here's another one back here that we can check and Again, that one's dead. Uh, another one up here. That's kind of sort of a lie. That's supposed to be a 10 microfarad, so that's a little low for a 10. But, yeah. So this is just a big recap job. Uh, so I'm not going to bore everybody with that too much. We're just going to draw out a map. Uh, find out what the values are. Mark them on the board. Pull the old ones out. Put the new ones in. And very likely that will resurrect the machine so that it works well but it's like I've said these purple Matsushita capacitors and the later dark purple ones which are almost kind of like a, a blue violet color uh, they're all bad they all leak they open they short they piss on the board they do terrible things to the machine so if you ever see them uh, it's very wise to replace them all so let's uh, make a map as to what we're doing here all right, so here you can see I've drawn out the map of the machine. The dotted areas are kind of locating marks, identifiers uh, to kind of gauge where I'm at on the board. All the values are written to the upper right. Um, value and voltage, maybe included a clock board there. So it's just a matter of acquiring what I need and then uh, marking the caps on the opposite side of the board so I can easily see them desolder them all, remove them all, and replace them. And then we'll uh, fire it back up and see if it behaves itself. Okay, so I gathered up the uh, capacitors needed. There's a total of 26 in this machine. And the next part is just obviously marking them on the board, desoldering them, pulling them out. I could troubleshoot and replace the ones that are disabling the machine, only to have the remaining ones I left in there fail later on so it's just not worth the troubleshooting time for me to figure out which ones are absolutely killing the machine and replacing them putting it all back together and then finding out later that something else is still wrong with it so we're just gonna mark the bottom of the board where all the capacitors are and um, go from there all right, so I have my board depopulated. I've got a nice fancy little pile of capacitors here, but unfortunately, while taking two capacitors out here, I slipped with my soldering iron, completely nailed the dial cord, and just murdered it. It just 
went through it like a hot knife like butter or a hot knife through butter so I got my replacement dial cord I'm not worried about doing that it's a fairly easy thing there's only a couple routing paths uh, but we'll first make sure the radio functions before we spend the time restringing the dial it's not my favorite thing to do and then we all have to figure out here why the uh, little senior dropping resistor here was getting so hot looking for an adjacent capacitor nearby that could be shorted um, which would be up in here somewhere and yeah, I don't remember which one of those I pulled that might have been suspicious but anyways um, okay so we've depopulated it's now time to repopulate and then we'll find out, turn it on, and figure out if it works or not. Before we get too far ahead, we do have to take care of this. Because we can see here that the glue has murdered this diode. It's probably a senior or something like that. So we'll have to figure out what that is. See if I can get some service literature. The glue ate through it. All I did was touch and it broke away. So, it's pretty pretty par for the course with the cups of corrosive brown glue. Uh, manufacturers of all kinds use this stuff to hold components in place. And their idea was, hey, we don't have to worry about things wiggling and jiggling around in shipment. Well, the problem is the glue becomes caustic and corrosive and even some forms of it are conductive. So it, it does end up eating parts as we saw here. So, I'm just going to scrape this away. Leaves that nice discoloration there, too. We're going to have to figure out what this uh, diode was here. It was a zener, but at what voltage? Let's see if we can find a schematic for this thing. Looks like D804. more of it over here it's just lovely I'm gonna use two hands to clean this up so far the only marking I can find on that is an a3 so yeah I'm gonna see if I can figure out what a3 is and we'll have to replace that thank God for hi-fi engine because they did have the schematic diagram and they have this d804 as a 10 volt Zener, at least that's what it looks like there, 10 volts, and it looks like C811 could have shorted, and that definitely would have uh, heated up that uh, 2K resistor that's next to it. So I wonder if they list that part specifically. This is the service manual. They have a part parts list. There we go. Let's see here. Diodes, D804, yep, D804, there it is, 10 volts inner diode, Let's see if I have one of those. Okay, so the closest I could get to this would be uh, two 5.1s in series, that would be about 10.2 volts, so 0.2 volt difference, I don't think it's really going to care, so we're going to series two of those up and stick them in the circuit. Okie dokie, so there it is, we got two... 5.1s in series. It's going to make it about 10.2. It's pretty close. Uh, I scraped this off. Look at how badly the board got stained by that glue. The glue's bad stuff. This is all nice and flat and happy. Um, cleaned up the leads on that capacitor there. I'm sure there's no more of this stuff creeping around because that's bad juju. Yeah, it's just there in the power supply section. Okay, well, that part's done. So uh, we'll get back to repopulating this thing and then uh, solder everything up and see how it goes from there. All right, so I got the board recapped. Everything's soldered in. I got the speaker hooked up. I'm sure now the question on everyone's mind is, is will it actually work or am I just a fool for recapping this thing? So let's go ahead and plug it in and give it some power. There's our clock. But 
I still hear nothing. Not so much as a hiss. Well, I hear a buzz from the speaker. That's a good thing. There's some signs of life. Let's see if we can take some voltage measurements here. Okay, so, so far, I've got 21 volts. Uh, at the Zener diode we replaced, we're holding at 9.2, so that's good. And that transistor there, not sure what that does. We got a negative voltage on either side, and then on the collector, it's all about the same. Are these like all shorted together or something? Is there something wrong here? Yeah. That can't be right. It's probably your switching transistor, I assume. So maybe we should check and see what Q602 does. Q602 works in the audio output stage. It'd be nice if it would stop trying to get the focus on that and hold the focus I put down. So all the everything is looking like it's in uh, it's on. Because that's a PNP device and it's all negative, but it's all negative all around. So I'll maybe check and see if that's shorted. Because that's looking like it's con it's a muting device or some kind of thing. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so this is actually a BC549, which is an NPN. So the fact that we have negative voltage on the base would suggest that this is off. It looks like, it looks like it's the output of the amplifier, so it's designed to mute things. And it could be in mute because... The machine isn't powering up or responding worth a damn. So we need to take a look at what actually controls the power to this machine. I turn the lights off and see if I can get any indicator from the uh, channel channel thing here. I thought before this lit up. So yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. We do get clock. Can I set clock? Yeah, it's like totally not responsive. Oh! What did I do? So what does that button do there? I don't know, what's, what's that labeled? That's the sleep. Sleep snooze. And then, okay, so. So if I touch the power button, it turned it off. And then touch the power, the sleep button, it comes on. That's a little weird. Okay, so let's see if I can uh, tune a station such as it is since the I broke the tuning string on it. Let me get two hands. Um, There's channel de, six. De buena voluntad, de, y, okay, so it's working. I don't know why I have to turn this thing on with the sleep button. That could just be a user error. I have the manual for this somewhere. I should look up how to use it. But yeah, it's running. So that's good. And yes, the little dial thing is illuminated. See if I can do a quick band scan here. Or call it. Ready to go. Works pretty good. All right. So it looks like all we got to do left is uh, restring the dial and then figure out how to really operate it. Okay. So uh, I managed to capture the last little bits of the string before. Uh, I took it off the pulley. So basically it starts here at your tie point uh, and we have to go up around the back side 
through this pulley up here. Uh, hold on. Let's get my fat hand out of the way. And let's change the lighting so that you can see this better. Okay. So we start here. There's two, tr uh, two grooves. We go back up this side over this pulley through this pulley wrapped around here three times and then go up and through the dial pointer there's a hole here in the board right there and the return from the dial comes back here and um, then we go around this pulley again and back around once or twice or three times something like that anyways you guys will get to watch me do that and then we can just enjoy the lovely frustration together. I hate restringing dial cords. I really wish I hadn't slipped with that iron, but it did. It was like one of these caps up in here that the line went across, probably one of these two, and I just whoop, right through it, and that was that. So we'll have to take care of that. But uh, we'll get situated, get to a point where I can deal with all of that mess, and then you can watch me restring it in sheer frustration. So we're going to see if I can actually restring this thing correctly. I tried a first attempt and found out I had strung it up backwards and I had missed one of these pulleys here because this is a double tiered pulley for some reason. I just wasn't paying attention. So I made some marks noting that counterclockwise is the lowest portion of the dial. So we're going to give it another shot and I've got my dial string now. I think what we're supposed to do is go here like this and then I have to go here and feed the string up through the hole so that we can go across the dial. Grab a hold of this from the top side and there's going to be limited visibility here because I can only move the camera so many ways, so this is just going to have to be how it is. And I'll try to move things around as I, as I can. This is why you don't bust the string. Move the speaker here aside. I was just verifying that the dial was in the right spot. And let's pull this taut. Yeah, don't get it tangled up in any wires either. So there's a pulley here, right there, that I have to run across. I also just now noticed there's a dial lamp here. I knew there was a dial lamp. It's out. We'll have to deal with that. And pardon me for just being an idiot. Let's keep this tight, put it on this pulley, and then come over here and string up this pulley. Okay. And looks like we're going to have to go around a couple times here. I don't think you can do more than two because this pulley isn't very wide. I think if I do more than two, it'll overlap and bind, so we're going to stick with two wraps around that. Also, it doesn't help that I don't have very thin gauge dial string. And we're going to come down here around this pulley, and then around this pulley. And let's just verify this. Good movement there. I need to come wrap around one time because otherwise I'm going to run out of string. Okay, let's kind of whoop. Yeah, let's not do that. I'm trying to pull this taut. My fat fingers can't grab the pulley. All right. So, what I'm going to do now. Pull this as tight as I can with my fingers. Just keep it taut. Of 
quick check here that is not uh, not moving the dial on its own so maybe we do need another wrap around that pulley not enough grip Yeah, in theory, that should be working. Should be working. Let's make another turn around the pulley here. It's about our max, though. Yeah, and then the problem with having three wraps is we got overlap in the binds. So got to be two. Let's see here. I think we got that. Yeah. Doesn't look like there's a whole lot of other ways to make this work. In theory, that should be working. So I may have to string this like really tight. And of course, I'm sure it won't work right. Yeah, this is the why I don't like restringing dials. So much to go wrong. Just checking and rechecking to see if I can make this work better. And I may check and see again if the service manual lists any tips or tricks about restringing it, but I don't recall there being a diagram or maybe I'm just an idiot and there was and I just haven't seen it yet. And then tensioning this is going to be another thing, especially considering how taught it it's going to have to be in order to work so don't break the dial string kids i also have a camera in the way so i may have to pause this momentarily to get this strung up right or the camera's just going to get bashed a bunch I think this was a system that was designed for much smaller uh, gauge dial cord, which I may have to find. So I'm going to loosen this, and I'm going to wrap the string around here as a temporary and tighten it. And see if it tracks properly. Yeah, it's just got to be under that crazy tension. And it's still having issues slipping. Or no, we got to the other side at least. Okay. So now, of course, it's not going to want to go backwards. All right, this is t pissing me off. I gotta find another way to string this or see if I'm just missing something on the diagram here. All right, so ultimately, uh, 
what I ended up doing here. And it's hard to see. Try to... I had to go to three turns on the pulley. Two just wasn't working. And then I had to grab two pair of hemostats so that I could uh, pull this taut and clamp it while I tied a knot behind it to get this to tension right. And I kind of jacked up the spring a little. But it works. Uh, I can... Yeah, now that I've said that, of course. Uh, <clears throat> I could turn it from one end to the other. So, but right at the bottom there, it gets stuck. It's not a tensioning thing. So, maybe it just needs more grip on the pulley. Like I said, this this design really called for really super thin dial cord, almost like nylon fishing string, but I don't have that. And I can also see that the tension is so high that it's actually pulling this bracket in. So I may put a shim in here between the board and the bracket to get it to work a little better so it's not so far tweaked but I can't find super thin dial cord and I tried some fishing line I had some fishing line that was like 18 pound test or something and that just even that was just not doing it for me so that works when we get down to the bottom here of course it's getting better as I use it so maybe it's a case of eliminating friction by lubing up all the little pulleys like this over here. Just got to remember to do it without getting any lubricant on the string. That would be a bad time. Oh yeah, that was sticky. That definitely makes it easier to turn. So maybe we'll put a little... <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm like really creepy today little tiny bit of oil on there yeah much better I think it's just a frictional problem Let's do the one up top here too. It's this guy up here. Just the tiniest little bit, just enough to get in there. The capillary action will suck it back down. Now it looks like when I turn it, I can get down to the bottom here and it doesn't bind. And I already put a dab of oil on here earlier. So a very picky mechanical system. <clears throat> so now I guess we can finally trim this. All right. And then, of course, we have to reattach the dial pointer. Let's see if I can move this to where you can see it a little better. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I don't know how well this is going to work, so bear with me here. So the dial pointers... Thing with the red and black wires up in there I think it's one of those uh, I can't even see it from your vantage yeah so see the little nubbins up there string goes on top of one and underneath two so I need to play with that some 
and I could have screwed myself because it might be that the wire, the string needs to go underneath the, the two wires for the dial pointer LED. So I'm going to play with that for a little bit and then uh, show you the results. Okay, so I got my dial pointer all uh, strung up in place there. It was a little bit of a struggle, but you can see now I go all the way across and back again. So that's happy. I'll have to check my oscillator reference. But I think we should be good. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, we gotta see if the what the uh, voltage on the dial pointer is. Okay, you got two ones that say lamp and LED. So we may have to check and see per the service manual what voltage that is. And according to this, it is a 14 volt 60 milliamp here. I think I have a 14 volt 80. That's about the closest I'm going to get. So there it is. A little bit of heat shrink is all we need. And it had a pretty burned little green filter there. I have a couple more of those in there I can use. So. Let's get to it. Okie dokie. We got this uh, new lamp in. A little green cock sock. And we're going to stick it back in here. And uh, it's supposed to go down to about here. We'll see how well this illuminates. And then uh, we'll check our oscillator and see if everything's cool. And so the big question of the day is, is will there be light? And let's see. Of course, you're going to be totally. You know, we have power. There we go. Hey, look, it lights up. Very cool. All right. Fades out too, even better. All right, let's hook up a speaker and check our alignment positions. I don't think there's going to be too much I have to do. This is pretty much spot on. I'm broadcasting at 98.5, and this is 98.1. Yeah, so we're good there. Um, let's see. That's pretty much going to cover it. Um, let's see. AM, 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 AM. One of these buttons is the... There we go. Back. The Democrats and fail past Democratic presidents. Pogo's 600 is spot on too, so. This thing's cool. All right, let's put it back together. All right, she is all back together. Time set, all the buttons work. In a different room and just keep that mask on when you're in contact with the Depression. Again, the phone now stepping. Colorado shines in the mask. I stay with him, but I the dealer. Speed bump. RB. Pretty hot tuner. Remember not. One a day. Sunny. Da That's what we'll do. So business handles even the parts Granger carries themselves. Final days get a. The Roma. Don't know the name. And I'm just using the little wire antenna that comes with it. With local rebates. I love. I'm total. Yeah, man, we're gonna. Top ten highest paid athletes in American team sports. Dude, you can as well. El llega cuando los problemas los tenemos ya casi al borde. Pretty cool. So this one was uh, quite an adventure, in addition to the complete recap, I had to restring it because my idiot itself broke the dial cord, but uh, great little radio. This is really a loud, it's about 2 watts, 2 watt amplifier, 2.5 watts, uh, and it's got tone controls. Obviously I'm not going to play any music because, you know, copyrights, but um, yeah, great little radio. Hope you guys enjoyed the video of the fix-up and uh, more stuff to come.